So Rams, you're watching People's Dispatch and this is the daily debrief coming to you as always from our studios here in New Delhi. I'm Shizan Thani and today our lead story is a bit of a page turner for aficionados of the uh, spy thriller genre and one that proves, uh, provides actually a trove of old stories to look back at, some which are older than the United Nations itself. The news point of course is that the UN has told the United States of America that spying on its chief. Uh, senior management and other officials amounts to a violation of all kinds of international treaties, including, of course, the 1946 Convention on the Privileges and Immunities enjoyed by those working for the United Nations. Uh, but almost in the same uh, breath, the UN Secretary General spokesperson, Stefan Dujaric, uh, told the world that his boss isn't at all surprised by the fact that his private communications are being intercepted uh, or listened to. And uh, what he finds more problematic is the incompetence that leads to those intercepts then making their way into the public domain. Uh, the UN Secretary General is right, of course. There's a long history of spying at the UN. Uh, the US has been uh, the foremost exponent of this game. Back when the UN Charter was being formulated after the Second World War, it intercepted diplomatic communications between several member nations and their embassies in Washington DC, London and Par Paris. Uh, thereby acquainting itself with the negotiating positions of all 49 nations before the dialogue even began. It then influenced the formulation of the UN Charter accordingly. Uh, these are of course means that some might consider slightly underhanded. Uh, and in this spy versus spy game that has been going on ever since, uh, the Bush administration decided that Kofi Annan and others were to be the targets as America and its allies pushed a war on Iraq that divided the rest of the world's diplomats. And now when Ukraine again has divided the world's diplomatic circles, last week's leaks indicate how little has changed in the mindset of the US security establishment. Uh, Abdul, I thought the idea of having a diplomatic core in place was to be able to have these conversations face to face. Uh, but the US instead seems to have a disdain for what uh, the concern of most of its allies is. Exactly. Uh, primarily what they call their national interest defines everything and that becomes the basis of violating most of the rules and regulations, conventions, etiquettes, whatever you call it, yeah. uh, of international politics, diplomacy, and so on and so forth. And that is exactly what US uh, has been doing. And this is nothing new, as you rightly pointed out. This has been going on forever. Mm. And uh, the, the problem is, uh, I don't know how uh, we see UN uh, Secretary General spokesperson saying that he is not uh, uh, much worried about what is happening, mm. but worried about what is exposed in the public. Mm. But the the most important part is, even if it is in public, mm. when it happens from the other side or any other country is involved, then it becomes a much bigger issue. That yeah. is the hypocrisy, which basically is nobody's, uh, nobody's talking about. Small uh, issues of uh, sometimes misunderstandings about other countries trying to kind of uh, influence uh, some of the diplomats at international level mm. becomes a big issue of country X influencing mm. Uh, mm. the democracy in some other country yeah. or country X spying through its uh, companies and through its uh, uh, other uh, uh, whatever uh, institutions mm. into uh, the politics of uh, the world's uh, oldest democracy. Mm. So all this basically becomes an issue only when the US is on the receiving end. And, uh, and, and most of the time it is blown out of proportion. But if you see today's newspapers, uh, today's uh, coverage of it, apart from the fact that Washington Post covered it, mm. No other, no other major newspaper, no other major website mm. has host has talked about it mm. in the detail which it requires. Only the, the very similar to what happened actually when those when the Iraq leaks happened, when it was a major headline everywhere else in the world except in the U.S. Exactly, and I, I'm saying not only in U.S. Even, even if you see the, the, the outside yeah. media, whether it is BBC or Al Jazeera, mm. they have not covered it the way they usually cover the accusations of spying. Mm done by country X on US. Mm. But when it comes to, uh, and this is a serious matter, uh, that the UN spokesperson is saying yeah. that that has happened yeah. and, there, and there is a report in yeah. the US in media talking about it and related to the larger leak, which is part of the US war games throughout the world. Mm. 
in some in sometimes they have their own close allies yeah. and uh, like south korea uh, and other countries have been involved they have a list of interfering in their sovereignty through these things mm. so it, sh it shows that there is no eagerness to kind of expose the uh, uh, misuse of uh, uh, us being the host country of united nations mm. and uh, it seems that gives it the immunity impunity to do whatever it wants to do and that that is how the level of the international diplomacy has reduced to that is how the uh, the shows are managed mm. that's how the legitimacy is gained mm. for even the illegal acts mm. like spying or uh, uh, in, uh, in inciting wars in uh, different regions of the world this uh, i know is a very cynical way of looking at it abdul but uh, is some of the and, and because you work in the media as well is some of the reaction from the world's press uh, a, a kind of uh, being resigned to the fact that this is how the united states uh, operates anyway uh, that, i understand yeah. that that might not lead to anything positive but uh, is that kind of is that part of what has uh, what we've come to today i am i'm not sure whether this is a resignation or this is basically a a, a part of the larger uh, uh, agenda and the game hmm. how uh, there are diff, uh, there are various works there are numerous works about how propaganda works hmm. uh, 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 and uh, there are scholars who have talked about it that how media is is, is used to manufacture consent yeah. in different uh, in different ways of course and this if you ignore Uh, the news that the that the un uh, secretary general may not be independent when he is stating uh, uh, taking his position mm. could be supposed to be his position yeah. or or the organization he is representing's position about say a war in ukraine and he might be saying such things under the influence of country a then uh, the whole idea that there is a international body which basically works for peace mm. becomes uh, redundant mm. it becomes uh, 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 basically a facade mm. and th that that means that the entire the process of uh, the legitimacy of the particular set of countries working for quote unquote peace is under question yeah. and if you ignore it then this the it is easy to manage the facade that US United States of America is a democracy it basically is working for the promotion of democracy mm -hmm. for the human right and other countries uh, are basically villains and you basically maintain this image while deliberate uh, omission and commission mm -hmm. basically okay don't uh, report the uh, or report it with certain kind of uh, cover uh, about uh, the issues which basically exposes the actual Uh, politics which the united states of america or any imperialist country mm. is following and uh, highlight and uh, 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 exaggerate when uh, 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 certain things are happening uh, on the side of the countries which are considered to be villains so this is villains this is part of the larger uh, uh, game which basically has is very significant when it comes to Uh, uh, uh international politics mm. uh, when it comes to kind of uh, creating legitimacy seeking uh, approval mm. and having wider acceptance mm. among the uh, uh, people across the world mm. and that media while deliberately uh, omitting about such reports and serious reports basically shows their true alieni a uh, true uh, um, uh, closeness or true uh, uh, what do you calling leaning, call it? leaning yeah. uh, uh, in, uh, in their uh, uh, in their uh, larger uh, uh, perspective yeah. and uh, quite disappointing also from the perspective that this is now a week old story the fact that yes. a formal complaint has been launched perhaps the un itself uh, hopes that the media will look at it as a serious matter and therefore put some pressure on the un nothing happens establishment yeah. but uh, but like you're saying uh, just that's uh, I, i'm just uh, saying that how south africa uh, south korea which is considered to be the closest one of the closest allies of yeah. the us yeah. has complained about uh, being interfered with hmm. by the united states hmm. germany in the past hmm. there were various reports which basically exposes how germany's politics mm. was constantly inter, inter, uh, interfered with mm. by the united states and nothing happened nobody talked about it
All right, thanks very much, Abdul, for your time today. Uh, we're moving on to our next story, uh, which is from Canada, where over 150,000 public servants have hit the picket lines under the banner of the Public Service Alliance of Canada. This is the union that has spent the past two years or so negotiating with the government for an acceptable new contract arrangement, including, of course, wage hikes for government employees who work across the spectrum of state services. Uh, as deadline day approached, though, there was no agreement between the parties. And as similar uh, negotiations have gone around the world, unions are fighting to negotiate deals for their members that at least keep pace with inflation and uh, what is now more or less a universal cost of living crisis. And also as with governments around the world whose policies, neoliberal policies, austerity measures, support for privatizing key services have actually created all of these uh, scenarios, uh, a meeting ground is not being reached. Uh, Anish joins us now via video conference for more on the latest strike as well as the position that the government is taking in response to it. Uh, Anish, as we were hearing from the leaders of the union, clearly they were left with no choice. Uh, but uh, despite all of that, the scale of this mobilization, this action is uh, quite impressive. Is the government feeling the heat? I mean, obviously, because we are looking at about uh, 120,000 uh, employees from the Treasury Department and another 35,000 from the Revenue Department uh, being uh, on strike. That is, and uh, this is the tax season over there. Right. So yeah. it's basically yeah. at the most opportune time uh, to actually be making sure that they that strike actually makes an, some kind of difference. Uh, this was this was definitely the time for them to do it, and mm. so it is not just that we're looking at also the grain export, the grain department, which is uh, basically the department that handles the grain exports. And Canada is one of the largest mm. grain exporting countries in the world, uh, and obviously the immigration department and other services that are going to be affected. So it's basically essential total shutdown uh, of uh, Canadian public services in many segments and that is going to only delay everything uh it is going to uh really put the government uh bring the government to a halt so even though it, it may not be like by uh, in terms of numbers the largest strike in canadian history but it is definitely uh, one of those strikes that actually is bring uh, is set to bring down the canadian government to its knees so definitely uh there is that factor but on the other hand we have to remember that uh, trade unions have always been uh, much like everywhere else where you have this sort of bipartisan or a bipolar kind of political party system uh, mm. where uh, usually the more center-left party gets uh, support from the trade unions. It's very similar right now in Canada as well, where uh, the Liberal Party pretty much ba tries to bank on uh, the trade unions and their support uh, to uh, for votes, actually, uh, in, uh, talking in their essential terms. Ex exactly. Exactly. Right. exactly. Mm. And so uh, to, you know, to alienate them would not be the best of their interest uh, mm -hmm. in any of the elections in the coming days. And we have to remember that this is something that has been going on since 2021. The negotiations that we talk about uh, has been going on since 2021. And nothing of, uh, you know, not, no kind of meaningful resolution has been, uh, you know, has been arrived at so far shows that there is something that is very lacking in the manner in which the government is uh, approaching the trade unions at this point in time. Mm. Despite the leverage that, of course, this particular set of employees uh, has, Anish, uh, and perhaps uh, in that lies some hope of a resolution being, uh, or, or some kind of at least tentative agreement being arrived at. But in a wider sense, like you were pointing out, it's a good example, Anish, of uh, how planned action can actually uh, empower workers to be able to take some of that economic power back from you know th uh, those who are otherwise making the decisions? Yeah, definitely. Because uh, in recent times, we've seen, uh, and, and it's not just Canada, but like North America, across North America, we've seen workers' movements uh, becoming more militant. Uh, we have seen more number of strikes than maybe the previous decade. Uh, and that shows that this militancy, a part of that is because of the recent, uh, you know, uh, economic fallouts of the pandemic. But also before that, economies were not really doing that well uh, in many places. And it's just the fact that inflation was rising, cost of living was rising. It just only it only exacerbated uh, with the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. And so 
uh, this militancy has also seen its own uh, set of, uh, you know, uh, a renewed, uh, a rejuvenated form in many ways, because we're looking mm-hmm. at like very, uh, you know, typically public ser- uh, service employees who are not that prone to militancy uh, in general, uh, when you talk about their de- overall, you know, the, uh, overall organization. Um, but uh, something of the sort coming uh, at this point in time is basically showing that uh, wages have not kept up with uh, rising costs and that is really affecting uh, many of the workers even the more uh, secure uh, the more uh, you know the, uh, the more secure public workers or public servants in the country and in one of the richest countries of the world in fact uh, yeah. and that really shows that uh, the, the that labor issues are becoming more and more common and not primarily uh, and this is only going to be uh, it, this is only going to get deeper and more widespread primarily because uh, a you do not have more uh, clear responses or good responses from governments uh, mm-hmm. and employers and b because uh, the kind of conditions that are leading to this militancy is not going away anytime soon prim- because of various other factors so we can expect more and more such uh, you know public uh, sorry labor organization and labor uh, mobilizations in you know the coming years as well no. Thanks very much, Anisha. Interesting developments there. And uh, another interesting story uh, that we are following up with uh, today, actually, which is uh, an, a much smaller strike by employees of a single company uh, in India, but also putting in very stark sort of spotlight conditions in which uh, a lot of uh, labor is operating. Thanks. Our final story uh, today is from India, and it also concerns a group of striking workers, a much smaller number, of course, in this case, belonging to a single company. Uh, But in India, of course, the the conditions are quite different. Uh, It is a country in the world with the largest working age population and facing multiple labor market challenges. Uh, Labor force participation, particularly among women, is extremely low. And despite uh, all of this, close to 35 million people who are actively seeking work are currently unemployed. The Modi-led BJP government uh, has consistently announced populist measures uh, to combat unemployment in the country, but has failed in its promise to create 100 million jobs. Uh, Leaders of the party now uh, often cite companies like taxi and rideshare services such as Uber and uh, logistics and e-commerce companies as successful job creation projects. Uh, What, of course, they ignore is the working conditions that these companies enforce on uh, their workforces and how they're uh, geared to exploit workers to the maximum in order to make some kind of profit, even though the models that they are built on are fundamentally quite questionable. Uh, And these are, of course, uh, workers who are stuck because of the lack of jobs in the market with very little options at all. Uh, Pragya, we're talking about the blanket strike that is on. This is uh, a logistics company that promises groceries right. uh, that arrive at your home uh, 10 minutes before uh, yeah before <laughs> as, you blink. as the name suggests yeah right yeah. Why, uh, forget about why you might need a coca cola in under 8 minutes uh, but what exactly why why are these riders now going on strike the the mostly men who uh, do these deliveries why are they striking what are they demanding what has the company changed Yeah, so for the delivery partners, uh, the company says for them, we have changed the payment structure, moving from what was about um, a little over half a dollar per delivery to a little under a quarter of a dollar. So 20 pence or 18 pence is what they, uh, cents is what they'll get for every delivery, uh, which we were just talking about. And it's not possible to reach the Indian uh, national minimum wage standard or cross the poverty line, Mm. Uh, even if they work 24 hours a day delivering constantly, 100 deliveries would make up about, you know, uh, a quarter of the daily calculation of the minimum wage. They are not going to make any amount of money. The interesting thing is that, you know, the Indian law has divided workers in, you know, gig workers into two kinds, Mm. those who work for various platforms, which Mm. are, you know, like these apps, Mm. which give you services, which give you a ride, etc. And then there are those which are not based on any platform, there's no app. Okay. Okay. But all of them are kept outside of the purview of the labor laws, which give them any rights, which an employee has over their employer. 
you know, so so there's no relationship of an employee and employer, mm. and therefore mm. there are no rights that accrue from mm. uh, from that situation. So they can actually suddenly slash these wages and then announce that well, seventy percent as Blinkit has that well, seventy percent of our workers have accepted this, and we have done this for them. Uh, and uh, you know, we find that in the current situation, the media is also in India tending to report this entirely from the company's point of view. Mm -hmm. Have they made a profit? Have they suffered? The workers were able to actually ensure that Blinkit had to shut about 50 stores, mm -hmm. their dark stores, from where they actually uh, commission right, these right. Like the, deliveries. The warehouse or uh, the warehouses, you know, which yeah. you actually never see as mm -hmm. a customer. So you don't know what are the conditions of work mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. But we do know that this wage is absolutely impossible to survive on it. You, you also have to remember that in 2021, the gig workers and the platform workers, all these app services had sort of assured people mm. that they would ensure the minimum wage. This is nowhere close to that. Obviously, I mean, it, it would then also lead to all kinds of things from road accidents to yeah. to stress and all, all kinds of impacts on, on the health of uh, the people working in this, which like you're saying, if they're not part of labor laws, then then it essentially, uh, can we consider it as a, a section of the workforce that nobody cares about at all? Absolutely. You know, and, and remember that there these are young people, young men who are educated to a certain degree and might be wanting to work for Enough a while. Enough to at least be able to use a smartphone and, and all of that. Absolutely, a smartphone, deliveries, mm. uh, calculations, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and also to save up to maybe study more, to save up to maybe buy something, to support their families. Mm. So these jobs not only do not take care of that, mm. But they also ensure that there is no mobility. There's nothing that you can actually strive for right. as a worker who's delivering, uh, you know, groceries to you in 10 minutes. Mm. Uh, for, like you said, for some unknown reason. Mm. Um, and, and the Indian government has actually done what it calls reform the labor laws. And they have adjusted all the pre-existing laws into four or five separate sets of codes. Mm. One of those codes mentions gig workers. It mentions platform workers, those who work for various apps. Mm. And it says that, well, uh, it mentions them. And it says that, well, this is not an employee-employer relationship. Mm. And so we have to figure out uh, how to take care of their social security. The thing is that we don't have to figure out. The government has to speak to the employees yeah. and the employers and figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So, but there because has we've heard the yeah. government also saying that that you know it's because of the economic conditions that the government's policies has created in India that these companies are setting up shop. These are right. Indian unicorns and uh, other such terms right. that these companies are given. Uh, so, so you can't take credit for uh, you know whatever uh, they're taking credit for but also say that no that it's not part of our uh, kind of purview yeah these these young kids will have no option but to you know sort of just agree to whatever terms they can the others who will find it unaffordable will quit mm. and look for another platform and the worry is that other platforms will think that well we can get away with this too mm. so you create this situation where not only do you have a low I mean, in fact, this time it's it's a surprise, but even the ruling party leaders have said that, look, this is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. You cannot reduce wages to this extent. But the company and the media have stayed very worryingly focused on how little loss it meant at the stock exchange, how little they lost in terms of profit or deliveries. And that is really a worrying sign. All right. It is indeed. Again, unfortunately, we've run out of time on the show for today. Uh, so with that, we'll bring to a close this episode of the Daily Debrief. Uh, as always, we thank you very much for watching and invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for more details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.